your enter is not valid. Your entry is not valid. Welcome to... <laughs> Enable audio controls. Please enter your audio... <laughs> Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, press star 1 to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be here uh, in today's uh, session on multi-tenancy basics. So just to give a quick re recap, we had uh, our first session a couple of days back where we talked about uh, some of the basics of SAS and uh, some of the terminologies involved and uh, uh, it's some of the root causes which leads us towards a multi-tenancy kind of a solution. In today's session, we'll be looking into, uh, from a multi-tenancy perspective, some of the basics in it and what multi-tenancy is all about, some of its advantages, disadvantages, and uh, how it's going to really help uh, solving some of the challenges in a SaaS environment. And we'll also look at some of the uh, vendors out there who kind of provide different solutions towards developing and deploying multi-tenancy platforms. So with that, I'll take the opportunity to introduce uh, our today's speaker, uh, Jyoti Rengarajan. She's one of our uh, technical architect. And uh, she plays a very key role in the R&D and development of a cello SaaS framework uh, which is a, a, a very distinct framework which allows you to develop applications in a rapid way. She has been the sole uh, architect and developer of that uh, framework. And she also plays a uh, role in the advanced technology group and uh, has focused towards the uh, SAS, uh, SOA, PaaS and IAA areas. And she has been working with uh, several of uh, customers in building different calibers of SAS solutions across different domains, namely SCM, HRM, and education. So with that, I'll hand over this uh, session to Jyoti. Welcome, everybody. So as uh, Janaki mentioned, we will be looking at the basics of what multi-tenancy is, along with some uh, insights on what are the different factors one should consider while choosing a multi-tenant model. And later, uh, half of the session, we'll also concentrate on the different deployment options you have in front of you while building a SaaS solution, be it multi-tenant or not. So to begin with what multi-tenancy itself is, when you build any product, you have a lot of architectural choices that you have to make, right from technology choice to the database choice and so on. But when it comes to a SaaS, product, the foremost uh, architectural decision that one has to make is whether or not the product is going to be multi-tenant or not. So what is multi-tenancy? So to explain it uh, in layman terms, is the ability to have multiple organizations um, data as well as application in a single instance 
and the ability of the software to support such kind of a model. So there are four kinds of maturity model available. So what you you are seeing currently are those. The first two model is what is termed as single tenant and the last two are called as multi tenant. So if you look at the first two models as the picture depicts, instance refers to the logical instance where your application is running and the tenant refers to the customer who's going to use as a who's going to use your uh, software so as you can see in the first two model each of the tenant is hosted in their own instance their own logical instance in the next two model the 3 and 4 if you see multiple tenants are accessing the software via the same logical instance. So the first two are called the single tenant model which is multi instance and the second two are called the multi tenant model which is single instance. Right? So there are variations within the single tenant itself and there are variations within the multi tenant model itself. The first maturity model in single tenant is one where each of the customer or the tenant could have their own code, right? A solution that's optimized to suit their particular need. So as the color here depicts, there could be one version or one customized source code that is being used for tenant one and there's another version or customized source code that's being used for tenant 2. Right? That's the first maturity model. Now this is very similar to an ASP model that existed some time back purely in terms of the deployment. Right? So you earlier on uh, before SAR there was an ability to take the software and package it and put it into a instance and make it available to a customer. So this is quite uh, similar to that pattern in its deployment. In the second model, it's very similar to the first model in its deployment, but here the software itself has the capability for configuration and hence though tenant 1, 2 and 3 have different needs, the source code that you have for all the three tenants are the same. But still from a deployment, they all have or they all are running under their own logical instance. So that's maturity model 2. In maturity model 3, as you can see, it's a single source code version that is being shared by all the three tenants as well as it's a single logical instance process that is serving all the three tenants. And Fourth model is uh, a slight variation to the third model itself in it. It is more scalable compared to the third model. In reality, when you start, you wouldn't actually stop with three because definitely you will need the capability to scale. So most probably you will end up in four. Right? So four gives you the ability to scale your application when there is a load. Right, so the instances you you see here are three, but it is serving all the three customers uh, without being tenant sticky. It's just that it's load balanced, and any request can be requ uh, any request can be served by any instance. So these are the four major architectural patterns that one could use to build a uh, SaaS product. So there are different factors that govern this decision of whether or not you should go for multi-tenancy and they they are time, cost, volume of the product and the product size. So we'll also look at how each of these factors are affected when it, uh, when it comes to these for uh, maturity levels. So operational efficiency, as you all know, when you have a single instance 
serving any number of tenants the uh, effort to maintain it or the effort required or the cost required to host it uh, run patches on it take a backup of it all these operations are going to be very effective so hence a multi tenant model is going to be very high in operational efficiency compared to your single tenant model which is level 1 and level 2 so similarly your maintenance efforts right whenever you are releasing a new version or a patch so the amount of time and cost required to do that in a single tenant model is going to be very high compared to what is required on a multi tenant model right so in terms of scalability again the ability to add more customers add more volume to your uh, product itself is extremely high in uh, a multi tenant model as compared to a single tenant model now the cons of it time suppose you have an already existing product that you want to move to a saas version then obviously the time taken to convert this particular product to a multi tenant model is going to be higher as uh, deploying it in a single tenant model itself so time is one important factor which governs whether you whether or not one would want to go on to a multi tenant model because when you have an existing product the time required to do completely rewrite it is more now transition cost again uh, especially when you have an on premise product that you are serving and that when you want to move it to a saas model if you take the multi tenant approach there is going to be a lot of development cost associated with it and hence transition cost is going to be high and engineering skill set so the skill set of your architects or developers um required to build an architect and multi tenant model is going to be high compared to a uh, level 1 or level 2 maturity levels which are very similar in nature to your on premise model itself so the very nature of multi tenancy brings in own complexity while it has a lot of advantages that we uh, currently talked about like operational efficiency maintenance efforts scalability it has its own uh, challenges in terms of architecting it and developing it so hence the engineering skill set that is required to build an architect a level 4 uh, product is going to be pretty high now customer value add so this is going to be pretty high for level 1 because whatever customizations your customers are going to ask for it is possible to do it in this model right because you have different source codes for different customer and hence you can completely customize whatever they can, they are asking for in other three levels while you can provide some amount of configurations or to a large extent of configurations there are going to be limitations in terms of the features that you support right what in terms of the customization support that your customer is asking for so in that um way level 1 is level 1 is uh, more friendly to your customer needs but uh, there are quite a uh, good uh, maturity that you can see in all the level 4 products in terms of its own customization capabilities that are uh, uh, it's uh, so we would also be looking at those features a little later so why should, why we also saw that your engineering skill set needs to be um, high and your customer value add is going to be less compared to a level 1 uh, model so why should we even go to a multi tenancy so the major 
attractive uh, factors for choosing multi-tenancy is actually the operational cost, maintenance cost. So, it uh, this, from uh, uh, the experience, it has been seen that there is at least 16 percent, um, 16 times cost advantage for a multi-tenant model compared to a single tenant model. And especially in SaaS, to sustain for long term, your operational efficiency needs to be extremely high and you need to bring down your operational cost as much as possible. So, and that's the reason why you need to keep your operational cost low and going for a multi-tenant model would uh, help you in doing that. So, if you have to um, do a, a complete analysis on whether or not you have to go to a multi-tenant model, these are the factors that you can look at. So, number of customers, current and target. Say, you have a large number of customers then you would benefit more from a multi-tenant model because if you have a large number of customers, the maintenance need and the, um, and the operational needs for uh, running them is going to be extremely high if you go for a single tenant model. So engineering budget constraints. So if you have a very stringent budget, so obviously you will not be able to rewrite your entire product and in this case, you will tend towards a single tenant model. Now again, time constraints is like your engineering budget constraint. In case you have a very uh, short time to hit um, hit the market, then uh, you would uh, tend towards a single tenant mo uh, model compared to a multi tenant model. Market experimentation. So, what happens is sometimes. SaaS itself is not proven for that particular product line and you want to quickly test out whether it's as a strategy SaaS will work out for you or not. So in that case, you wouldn't want to spend a lot on rewriting your current uh, software and hence in this case going for a single tenant model will help. Scope and size of transition. So if you are looking at only a very specific feature to be put on uh, SaaS, then very quickly you can experiment that with going to a single tenant model. Now again, reusability of current app is one another uh, factor. So if you think that you have a very huge product and you want to reuse for uh, because it's very risky to rewrite it, then you would tend towards a single tenant model. Now, within multi-tenancy itself, there are different uh, architectures that you can choose. Right? Multi-tenancy we saw is a model wherein one logical instance or an application is serving multiple customers. But within that application, there's one more factor that you need to consider, which is the data architecture. The data architecture itself can again be single tenant or multi tenant. Right? So, you can have multiple databases for each of the client itself. For example, tenant 1 can have their own data store, tenant 2 can have their own data store and so on. So, while the application is multi tenant, as you can see in the, see the center uh, piece, your application is multi-tenant, but your database is not. So though this is still called a multi-tenant application from a data architecture, it's a single tenant database. So if you look at the first piece, it's completely multi-tenant, wherein the application is multi-tenant as well as the data is multi-tenant. So when, when you are looking at the database, Typically, you will have to look at all the storage for your application. It could be a database, it could be a cache, it could be files that are stored in the system.
So you need to bring in the multi-tenancy in all these areas. So it's just not the database. Right? So in the first model, all of these are going to be multi-tenant. So these are the two variations within multi-tenancy itself that you can adopt to. Uh, with, we just saw that in those two degrees, one is completely single uh, a database per tenant and in the other model, it is uh, completely multi-tenant. But in reality, in a lot of cases, you will end up with a mix and match. So there could be one huge customer to whom you want to dedicate a server and only for that customer, you would go for a separate database and you can still have multiple customers data sitting in the other database. So that's called a hybrid tenancy. So you will bring in the multi-tenancy for few groups of customers and only for certain set of customers you will still go in for single tenancy. And the reason why you want to go for a single tenancy for a sing uh, just a customer could be like security. Maybe the customer is not willing to share his data with the other tenants or performance. Maybe the data of that particular client is so huge that it completely justifies to have a separate instance for him. So while you are architecting multi-tenancy, you should also keep in mind that there could be a mix and match where you would need to bring in and certain tenants alone you should treat them in a single tenant model and other customers you should treat as, treat in a complete multi-tenant model. Now, private SaaS is pretty much like what a hybrid tenancy is. It's, it's supporting an on-premise installation for certain customers. So this is one another factor that you will have to keep in mind while architecting a multi-tenant solution. While the major software can reside centrally and offered as SaaS, there could be few customers who are not willing to go as a SaaS. So the same version of your multi-tenant software, you would take and install it for a particular tenant inside their premises. Right? So that's again one of the variants that you might encounter and you will have to consider. SaaS by verticals, this is again very uh, common wherein say if you are supporting three or four market segments. So it is uh, possible that you cater one segment tenants into one instance and the other uh, segment tenants into the other um, instance. So say retail customers, you put it in one instance and other customers you put it in other instance and so on. So this is again a one consideration that you can have. So these are different kinds of uh, um, basic architectural decisions that you will have to take before you proceed further with any development in, the, in a SaaS uh, um, product. So there is also a need for multi-tenancy in a non-SaaS environment. So last uh, session we saw a SaaS and analogy for an internal IT, right? So multi-tenancy as such is an architectural pattern and it is not something that's unique only to SaaS. This pattern can be taken and applied to an internal application also. For example, let's if you consider a classic case of a BPO kind of a platform, right? So there could be multiple customers who are coming in and using that platform and there could be multiple branches of uh, the BPO organization using the same. So here, there are going to be multiple customers' data sitting in your application. And again, all that you need in SaaS becomes mandatory here as well like data isolation, having different uh, uh, access uh, control lists, and so on. So having a multi-tenant architecture to serve or serve the need of such a BPO platform becomes 
necessary. So, while we while a SaaS product can exist without multi-tenancy, it is also possible for the multi-tenancy architecture or the thought process itself to be applied to non-SaaS products, especially in a big um, IT application serving multiple customers and serving multiple branches. So here in this picture, as if you see, there is a CRM application that's being used by different branches like GAUS, GAUK, GAASIA and it is also being used by GE's different customers. So when GE's customers log in, they should get a feel that they are the only people who are coming and seeing the system. And similarly, there could be a complete data partition between GAUS and GAUK and they would feel as if the software is serving only them. So in such a case, you will model it the same way as you would model any SaaS product. Okay, so so far we, uh, we looked at what multi-tenancy is and what are the different degrees of multi-tenancy uh, within uh, uh, whether, whether be it a data architecture or the different variations that you can expect to bring in multi-tenancy itself like a hybrid tenancy and the need to have an on-premise installation in the SaaS itself. Now, all these things come up with a lot of architectural challenges. So you, there are normal challenges when you build a product itself. But with SaaS, it becomes higher because of its volume. It, SaaS itself becomes profitable only after you hit a large number of customers and large number of users within that customer. So what happens in a multi-tenant model is most of the time, all these data are going to sit together and all these users are going to access a single instance of your application, which means your concurrency is going to be higher. The load that the application is going to process is going to exponentially grow. So these are the major concerns when you go for a multi-tenant model. So these are whatever you're seeing in the left are the parameters that one has to watch very carefully when architecting a multi-tenant uh, product. So first to start with is the scalability. Scalability is the ability of the system to handle load gracefully and grow. Right? Today you might be having two customers. Down the line and after two months you will end up in say 50 and then 100 and then you can go to 1000. So the same software should be able to completely perform for the entire load. So you will have to architect for it right from day one. Right. So what you typically uh, do when you scale an application is simply to put it in a load balancer, right? So scaling itself has two portions of it. One, scale up and scale out. Scale up is adding more resources to your box itself so that you make it perform better. But it will always hit a rooftop and hence scaling out, which is introducing another box to balance of the load is necessary. Scaling out an application is quite simple these days. Be it any technology, you can have a, either a hardware load balancer or software load balancer and it, it's going to take care of load balancing your application. But when it comes to a SaaS model, a lot of thought process has to go in on how are you going to scale out your database, especially in a multi-tenant model. So today there's one box let's say your technology is SQL, so there's one box of SQL Server storing all the tenants' data. And today there is 100. 
right? Tomorrow when it moves to 200, obviously this box is not going to be enough to serve all the data. So you will have to introduce another box to balance the load, right? So right from day one you should think about it because otherwise there is going to be a lot of redundant data that you would replicate when you introduce the new box. So ability to partition or have a scale out strategy for a database is also mandatory when it comes to a SaaS model. Performance is the next uh, key parameter. So as we just discussed, the data and the concurrency is going to go exponentially higher in a multi-tenant model and hence the system has to really perform very efficiently for such a case. So the way you write your uh, code and the design, everything should have performance in mind. And this is one very crucial aspect of a multi-tenants model. Availability is another key factor that you should watch out for. Typically, 99.99% uh, .99 is what is expected by all the products. So you need to actually make a call on how important or how business critical your application or a software is going to be and come out, come out with SLAs and you need to choose all your technology choices. Let's say you're going to put your uh, SaaS product in a cloud and they don't support such an availability. Then it is a problem. Right, so based on your availability SLA, your technology choices or your deployment options itself could be extremely different. So that's something that you need to watch out for. Security has been always one of the key concerns when it comes to SaaS. So it's very, um, it, it's uh, a mandatory that you have a complete isolation between uh, different data. You have proper encryption mechanisms or proper uh, sealing mechanism to seal one data by from being exposed even to a maintenance uh, person or some other source because it's some, some other organization data that's going to sit within the SaaS provider's end and there are lots of chances that the data gets leaked. Right? So from that perspective, there needs to be a lot of security on the way the data is stored itself. In addition to that, a complete role-based access system has to be uh, in place in the product because the access, rec access control requirements of one product could be very, one customer could be very different from the other customer. So the product should have the capability to configure the complete access control list so that the tenant comes and defines the way they want the security to be maintained within the system and move on. Integration is one another important factor. While, uh, while the product was on-premise, the integration itself is simpler because it's just going to talk with other applications within the firewall. But when you take it and move it in a central place, you should have a mechanism to completely integrate that particular product with the other uh, products within the on-premise. So this could e even include authentication details like you would need a single sign-on. You would have to integrate with the identity management systems of your on-premise or, or an active directory within the on-premise. So typically authentication or federated kind of authentication becomes mandatory when you move to a multi-tenant uh, model or even a SaaS model for that matter. And definitely you will have to have specific set of uh, APIs exposed which can be consumed by your uh, on on by your organizations or the customers to draw data out so that they 
they would want to have a copy of the data and hence it becomes necessary for you to expose data in very customer friendly way so that integration also that that integration capability also is uh, mandatory in a saas product a configurability is ability to completely customize or configure the instance of uh, the product according to a customer's need so this could include from a very simple logo to a very complex workflow or a business logic so let's assume a case where tenant 1 needs certain set of fields in a form tenant 2 could need other totally different sets of fields so the product should be able to completely customize the forms the data they see the business logic the workflow everything based on each of the tenant now the requirement to which level you have to configure your product is totally based on the uh, uh, software's nature itself but most of the cases this becomes one important element for a self serviced application so that when a configuration is asked if it is right there in the product then it is easy for the for the customer to believe that the product can do anything for their requirement and adopt more to it so this is one very important feature that you will have to consider and one important element that you will have to architect for auditing again is one important element with respect to the security itself it's very important no to know who has done what from an organization's end again from your own um, saas provide saas providers end on what changes have been done in the application and to track it so having a very um sophisticated or robust auditing mechanism will later help to solve a lot of security issues so this is one very important element that you have to consider by architecting a saas product so as you can see it, while multi tenancy just talks about data isolation it doesn't stop only there so it brings in a lot of other non functional requirements like what we just saw that has to be built into the product right from day 1 and this complete stack of your engineering has to be very solid so that the other blocks can be conveniently built on top of it so so far we have covered what multi tenancy is and what are the different variations in it and we also looked into the architectural challenges that one might encounter in building such a multi tenant model now coming to the deployment options there are uh, four different routes that one can take to deploy a saas product be it multi tenant or single tenant so the first obvious uh, choice is self hosting where the saas provider chooses a data center and then they might use a virtualization technique or spin out different service to host uh, their saas product now self hosting is possible both for a single tenant and multi tenant application so but in a single tenant application virtualization technique becomes more relevant and in fact it becomes sometimes mandatory otherwise you will have to end up getting a lot of service so the first option is self hosting so i think virtualization as a technique uh, you would all know but just to give an uh, intro it's the ability to spin out multiple virtualized instances from a same server and each of these instances are completely partitioned uh, from from each other so that it virtually acts like a different server so in fact this is one of the ways you can even uh, 
give out an access to a legacy application. So you can have multiple virtual instances hosting your legacy application and then open up, open it up remotely that end users can come and access it. But again it carries all the disadvantages of a single tenant model itself being uh, the virtualization cost itself could be higher and uh, maintenance of it could be uh, quite high. So these are uh, the pros and cons of going with uh, a self-virtualization. So when you go for your self-hosting, you completely have a control on technology. So you might use any kind of uh, licenses, you might use any kind of uh, uh, soft softwares in the system. So you're not limited to the choice of technology that you can go with. And there's absolutely no vendor lock-in. It's your software, just the hardware that you're purchasing and then um, installing it. So it, it, there's absolutely no vendor lock-in there. And you also have quite amount of control on the functionality. If you go with certain other options which dictates your technology and so on, you are going to be limited by functionality. So in self-hosting, you get all these advantages that you're, you have a complete control. The downside of it is it obviously have a, has a higher capex because you will have to acquire a server and even if you go for virtualization, virtualization softwares are going to cost you higher. And hence, your capital expenditure is going to be pretty high. And you need to maintain a full IT team in order to manage your servers, manage your virtualized instances, taking DB backups, and so on. So that's another disadvantage. While your uh, core focus is going to be on developing a product and taking it to the market. You might also have to completely invest on a IT team on an ongoing basis, which is again going to increase your OPEX. Infrastructure security needs have to be managed. Again, SaaS comes with a huge sets of concerns in terms of security and there are, it's going to be a huge set of questions that your customers are going to ask you in terms of your network security, your firewall security and so on. So a lot of um, uh, care has to be given here by yourself in maintaining it. Again, application monitoring and Scaling needs to be manual. So in case you have a search and suddenly um, you have, uh, you want to bring in two more instances, you will have to do that by yourself. You will have to get more servers and you need to do it by yourself. And that's going to be a bottleneck for an immediate ramp up and ramp down. So these are the major advantages and disadvantages of uh, going with a self-hosting or self-virtualization. Now the next option, as you can see here, is IAS. IAS stands for Infrastructure as a Service. Like software as a service, which means a software is delivered to you as a service, right? So as in a pay-as-you-go model, you a software is delivered to you and it's centrally hosted. In a similar manner, IAS means that an infrastructure is available to you as a service. So on a on demand as a pay as you go model, hardware is available to you to use from a central location. Right? That's what IAS means. So a typical example of an infrastructure as a service is Amazon EC2. So what they provide you is a complete computing resources on demand. So what you would be able to request instances, your instances could could be of any um, 
specifications like you would uh, you will be able to get a windows 2008 instance or a linux instance or windows with a sql server instance or um, a linux with mysql instance and so on and everything from um, hardware to network to firewall and everything is as such given to you so once you purchase the instance for how much hours ever you have used you need to pay for it so that's a that's a very attractive model so you don't have to purchase any service upfront which is going to be extremely costly and as you want to increase the instances you can increase it and pay only for what you have used so this drastically reduces your capex and also allows you to make any investments very easily and go and deploy a solution with the fullest capacity very easily some of the pros and cons and of going with such a model is the major advantage is it comes with a complete inbuilt inbuilt infrastructure security so uh, then uh, amazon itself would have taken care of all these things and hence you need not have to bother about it flexible ramp up and ramp down whenever you need another instance it's very easy to get it uh and even when when you think that you don't need a instance you can instantaneously release it and your cost comes down instantaneously the rest this becomes a little difficult once you have procured a server right so once you have procured a server you need to keep it but here it's very easy to ramp down as well lower tco um total cost of ownership is very less because you're just going to start with very minimal money and it is more an operational expenditure and not a capital expenditure and it's not a big investment that you will have to make in the start so it's very attractive model full control and technology since iaas as such gives you only the mission so you are it's as if instead of buying a mission you are renting a mission so whatever you uh one you can typically install within that mission so once you have let's say uh once you get a windows 2008 or 2003 mission whatever you can install within 2003 or 2008 you will be able to do it there so that kind of gives you a flexibility on uh your choice of technology compared to other other kinds of uh platform as a service we will also be uh, looking into those Uh, just to get you get a uh, relative uh, comparison the control here is much more no uh, vendor lock lock in so it's very similar to your own data center right so whenever you want to take out whenever you want to take out your application you will be able to take it out and even here you will be able to take it out but having said that the vendor lock in itself is true only when you have opted for the uh, machine now amazon kind of infrastructure as a service also off offers you a data storage so they have something like um uh, rd amazon rds which is similar to a mysql uh, dbms but available to you on the cloud but if you have chosen to go with such a data storage you still have some amount of vendor lock in because you are dependent on that technology and you are dependent on that availability and so on but if you are purely uh, going only for a mission or just renting an instance then the vendor lock in is absolutely nil and you will be able to take out your uh, uh, software anytime you want the so cons of it a partial it team is still required so you still have to manage to some extent the databases that you have provided you don't go to a amazon rds kind of data storage you still need to take backups of your uh, server in amazon and see to that your applications inside 
the instances are up and running because amazon as such amazon kind of fias has no clue on what you have installed inside the box so that will guarantee only that the instance is up and running but it it has no clue on what is running inside so the application that reside within the instance has to be still managed and maintained by our it team hence a partial it team is still required application application monitoring and scaling needs to be manual as uh, discussed in the uh, previous point here the application that Uh, is installed within the instance has to be maintained by yourself because Amazon has no clue on what is there inside the instance. So I pass or which again is a pass more inclined towards an infrastructure. A good examples of I pass would be Azure or GA. See the need. that i pass uh, tries to solve is very much similar to when ias they also offer you the computing resource but the model is slightly different here they also offer a run time on top of which your on top of which your application runs so while you develop you develop with non proprietary technologies like dotnet in the case of azure a python or java in the case of gae and then you host it on azure or gae but you have no clue on what is actually running these applications right in ias you will still be working with say ias for dot, uh, .net or um, uh, apache for java and so on but in as you are it's completely abstracted and ga is completely abstracted you would not know what's actually running your software so there is a platform on top of which your application is running so there is a there are going to be obviously limitations because of this in terms of the technology itself so because something else is running your application you will have to follow all the design norms or um, the technologies that are given by these pass right so that's the major difference between ias and i pass but the need that both of it are trying to solve a similar they both ias and i pass are providing you the computing resources we'll also look at the pros and cons of it um auto scale is one of the um, major advantages of i pass so automatically you can um, increase the number of instances and uh, you can scale out your application on the fly lower tco as we saw in ias the total cost of ownership is again going to come down here because this is again a pay as you go model so once you host your web application into um, say as you you are going to pay only for the time that you are going to use that you have installed that application so your total cost of ownership is still going to be less as in the case of ias better control on functionality because it's again written on non proprietary technologies like dotnet and java which is quite mature you you can completely take a hold on functionality and the development is quite similar to what you would otherwise do in a uh, self hosting you still use your own uh, native development technology like uh, you would either use uh, visual studio dot net for developing in azure or an eclipse for developing in uh, gae and then once you're done with the development is where you would uh, go and host it in azure or gae so from that perspective whatever features you want to bring out in your uh, product you'll absolutely be able to do so uh, the disadvantage of the biggest disadvantage is obviously going to be a partial lock in since you are limited uh, by certain decisions you will still that
portion of code would have been written for specifically running an Azure platform or GAE platform. So, in case you want to come out of that, at least that that amount of portion you will have to rewrite and data itself is going to be stored within Azure or GAE and it's not going to be under your control so there is a partial lock-in there. Again, text design limitations as discussed earlier, you cannot uh, completely go with XYZ software and install on it because you're completely abstracted. It's a complete black box that you get. Hence, you have to go by whatever is supported within Azure or GAE. So, from a uh, from a technology perspective, there is going to be a uh, limitation. Now, there's again a, another variation to the path itself called a migration path. So, this is interesting in the sense what this allows you to do is to develop an a software which is completely on premise and once you deploy it in the migration path it becomes multi tenant so that when you have a patch you just you're going to apply it on one instance but the migration path itself is going to take care of maintaining for multiple instances and so on. So that way you don't really have to bother about coming up with a multi-tenant architecture or anything and you just can develop and maintain your product like you have always done with an on-premise and the migration path completely takes care for you on making it multi-tenant. It also has other functionalities that are typically needed for a SaaS product like uh, subscription and inbuilt access control uh, management and so on. The advantage of it is obviously the faster time to market. You don't have to really spend a lot of time in um, redeveloping your entire solution assuming you already have an on-premise uh, product. So the development cost or the transaction cost is also going to be uh, lesser and there is an inbuilt scalability which means that once you have taken it to the past it completely takes care of your load but the disadvantage is, is the biggest disadvantage here is the vendor lock-in so you are going to be dependent on the migration path to keep running your multi-tenant uh, uh, software so in say you have an on-premise software that you have posted on migration path and right now we want to come out of it. All that you have right now, when you come out of it, you only get your on-premise software. You don't get back your multi-tenant software. So in order for you to keep running your SaaS solution and multi-tenant uh, software, you need to stick on to that migration path. So there is a deep vendor lock-in there. So that's the biggest disadvantage. And there are going to be functional limitations and tech design limitations. So the choice of technology you cannot play around much because it's completely managed by the migration path. So if they want you to definitely have a web service layer, you should have it. And you should have modeled it in certain way that the uh, migration path itself can act on. So all these things are necessary to um, move to a migration path. And hybrid model, right, like a private SaaS, if you want to um, also support a private SaaS model where certain tenants are going to be in a single tenant application, certain are uh, required to be on a, um, on premise, it's a little difficult here because there are certain portions of your software that, that are going to be dependent on the migration path itself. So, Taking the software and putting it into an on-premise might be a challenge in this case. So this gives you a picture on what you can do, what you can use in a single tenant model and what are the deployment options you can use for a multi-tenant model. So self-hosting, what it means in a single tenant system is you go for virtualized instances, you'll typically have 
one instance per tenant. So in a multi-tenant system, you will have few instances which are only for the sake of load balancing. Maybe it's, it's like uh, for 100 tenants, you might have just three instances and so on. Just as a, a fact, typically force.com uh, goes to, let's say, more than... Uh, it has it, it has around 55,000 uh, customers, but the number of instances it is using to um, host is very very less. So that way, your cost is going to extremely come down in a multi-tenant system. So IAS uh, examples are Amazon EC2. Again here. You will go. You will purchase one instance per tenant in Amazon, whereas you will have very few instances just for the sake of load balancing in a multi-tenant environment. In infrastructure uh, path, again you will go for one instance or one uh, one instance of either a web or a worker role or a database. Whereas in a multi-tenant system, you will have very few instances. Again, just for the sake of load balancing. Migration path, single tenant system, it's not applicable. In multi-tenant system, it's going to be one software that you put in there and completely migration path is going to take care of it. So these are the different deployment options that you have in front of you to choose for a single tenant system and multi-tenant system. So as you can see, multi-tenant system has a lot of benefits when it comes to cost be it uh, maintenance cost or operational cost. But it also has its own uh, challenges in the way you architect it. And that's what we will be detailing out in further sessions on insight, with a complete insight on each of the factors that we uh, discussed here, be it scalability or performance or availability. We will look into each of these points in detail and see how possibly you can architect or what are the different things that you will have to consider to, uh, in order to deliver all these non-functional requirements in a multi-tenant environment. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Jyoti. Um, attendees can feel free to uh, raise their questions in the questions window or the chat window. We'll try to answer as much as we can. So one of the questions is, in a single tenant application hosted on data center, one instance per client, does it mean all patches fixes should be done to all instances manually? Yes, you will have to uh, do it manually and you will have to apply the patches to all the instances. Whether or not you do it manually is uh, up to you. You can write your own utility to apply the patches across. But definitely some amount of manual intervention is always needed because you typically check the system after a patch has been installed, right? So at least that, that amount of check has to be done with manual intervention. Of course, you would... Um, typically end up writing an utility to apply the patch to all the instances. Okay. So there's another uh, question. How can we determine the threshold for adding instances? So I'm assuming you're talking about uh, a partition kind of scenario where you would require to add more instances in a multi-tenant environment. It purely is driven by your uh, resource consumption itself. So if you feel that a current instance has 
he's hit the rooftop in terms of its processing capability and memory that is then you would go for another instance but there are possibilities that you would span out another instance for a tenant not just for performance reason but purely for a security reason so that that's again one another thing that you need to uh, take care So what is the expected cost saving by having multi tenancy in uh, in place so as uh, we saw typically 16 uh, times cost saving or operational cost saving is expected when you go for a multi tenant uh, model okay how effective is multi tenant how effective is a multi tenant model for enterprise use compared to small businesses um i'm assuming you are still when when you when you say enterprises with small businesses you are meaning if your uh, product itself is serving small businesses with uh, enterprises in fact i would uh, say for a small businesses it's going to be higher because to be profitable in saas you would expect very large amount of tenant especially when they are small business so the efficiency of your system is going to grow exponentially higher in a multi tenant model in this case can you explain about migration path with some good examples yeah one one of the migration uh, path is saas grid saas grid uh, is a prod uh, is a is a path wherein you develop a dot net on premise product and then when you put on it it becomes multi tenant so that's one good example for a migration path what kind of performance loss can be expected when going into a virtual with a physical server obviously there is going to be a hit when you go for a virtual instance as uh, um compared to a physical server especially when you go for things like a database there is a hit um but i don't think there is there are lots of virtualized uh, virtualization technology so there's not a single number which exactly quantifies this is the exact amount of loss that you are going to get how software manufacturing industry is supportive for multi tenancy as compared to conventional license to sell as this may, may lead to loss of revenue to them it is actually a a good uh, question so i think it it what you are trying to ask is a saas model itself saas model with a perpetual license model how does it compare what uh, typically some of the organization do is to support both so they provide the um, on premise versions with certain features and then they may be stripped down the feature in a saas version or completely start another product line which is like an add on as a saas saas version so that way they see to that they get two revenue streams and one does not cannibalize the other okay in multi tenancy as i said lot of pieces need to be integrated on the basis of standards are those standards will be discussed in the next session is or uh, yeah yes we would uh, be uh, getting into details of that in the coming sessions how are the customization abilities in a multi tenant model for different customers like um like i uh, mentioned earlier 
the customization is not going to be done at the code level it's going to be completely metadata driven and this is one important feature that you will have to um, build in in your feature itself right so you will have a complete metadata system that says what are the kinds of customizations you need on the form be it a logo be it themes be it business tools be it workflow everything should be generic and should be driven by configuration and should not touch the um, code what is uh, what is proper exercise to determine server specification based on number of users expected and growth expected i think this is very uh, similar to an exercise that you'll otherwise do on a capacity uh, um, on a non premise model also just uh, something called a capacity planning and hardware sizing you will have to have a projected number and do a complete hardware sizing to determine that number okay how much flexibility for customer specific functionality is reasonable to be expected in a multi tenant application well um i think having a very strong product road map or a product boundary is necessary for saas otherwise we have seen cases wherein um, completely the product has been caught up in just addressing the petty feature request from customers uh, as compared to addressing some of the long term features so drawing the boundary is very very uh, necessary but having said that in in saas model it is also extremely important to satisfy the customer because a churn can completely turn your ball uh, i mean uh, all game so what happens in these products is a good amount of customization capability through configurability is already built in place so that most of the requirements such as having needing to have a, an additional uh, field for data capture or uh, um, making a field mandatory or non mandatory or changing a business rule from uh, across tenants or changing the workflow steps itself between tenants are all given right in the product itself even things like giving the ability for the customer to read i mean render their own report or generate their own query so all these things are inbuilt in the product so that it doesn't you don't have to really um build it as a feature but it all goes as a part of configuration Okay. So I think uh, that's the questions we have for uh, today. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you for uh, answering all the questions and the wonderful session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, once again taking the time to be here with us. And uh, just also as a reminder, we have our next session on twelfth, this uh, coming Tuesday. Uh, we look forward to see you all over there as well. And uh, please uh, do share your feedback uh, or comments uh, to us. Um, thank you. Have a great day. Bye.